there. Howdy, howdy. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Sorry about the uh, time mix-up. It's uh, uh, no issue either way. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting here at the computer, so yeah, it we're, yeah. Change much Same of anything here. from my perspective. Um, yeah. Would you uh, Would you like to introduce yourself to the class? It's a large and invisible Absolutely. classroom, but it is there. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So my name is uh, Morgan Kegashange. I am an Anish Nabe Ojibwe living in Southern Ontario. Um, I am a full status um, Indian under the Indian Act of Canada, which means I have any and all rights associated with being a full status um, uh, Indigenous persons in Canada. And um, just to give a bit of background context, um, one of the reasons why I felt like I might be able to opine on the discussion that we're going to have is because my reservation actually has received a parcel of land back from the federal government, as well as paid out a chunk of restitutions that went along with that. So um, that's about it. That's who I am. Nice. That uh, that slaps. My chat humbly asks your pronouns uh, uh, out of respect. She, her, or they, them is fine. Okay. There you go, chat. We got anything to quit spamming it. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. So uh, I, I'll just say um, that I, I appreciated your email. Usually when I have conversations on issues like these, I'm talking to people who aren't really directly affected by that stuff or whose investment mm -hmm. in it is kind of an abstract intellectual or ethical concern rather than something more immediate. And um, yes. I thought the conversation that I had with Professor Flowers was really unproductive for a few reasons. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with at least most of them. Um, yes. Right. It's The thing that bothered me the most is that I feel like sometimes the loudest advocates for indigenous issues online are also the worst and like most disingenuous ones. Where in, Absolutely. Where, where, yes, where indigenous issues are like, because it's, I, you'll have to forgive the internet terminology, but it's like, it feels like a very virtue signally thing sometimes to be very mm -hmm. yeah. in favor of decolonization. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, pro land back. But then when it actually comes to talking about these issues and actually like, mm -hmm reconciling like sometimes it can get i think a little bit um well there's there's a, cl a clear dissonance so that's my feeling on it but like what's your impression of all that so um i tend to think about it in in two types of ways um i i try to give people the benefit of the doubt as often as i can um by thinking okay maybe it's just that they haven't you know, spent the time necessary to, to get everything together and maybe they're just struggling with articulating the, the cause appropriately and that sort of thing. But every now and then you do meet people who say or who do things like they are trying to use um, talking points about Indigenous authority, actualization, um, land back movements, all of these sort of things, not because, uh, because they're banking on on the knowledge that the general public is going to be just as ill-informed as they are. And so they're kind of betting on this, um, um, like especially between the debate between um, uh, Professor Flowers and Dr. Heemdout was where I noticed that Dr. Heemdout as an immigrant was somebody that um, was less informed than probably the majority of people who were, um, for, I think he's from Canada, right? Dr. Hemdown? I can't remember. Yeah. I believe so. But let's say he's from Canada. And so if he's immigrated here, um, there's a chance that his social circles and the way that, you know, our social structures kind of section us off, he's just not going to be as well informed in um, talking points about Indigenous land back movements. He's just not going to have the same kind of um, background knowledge on that as an actual Indigenous person might. And the, there's there's a chance, I don't want to say that this is how it was, but there's a chance that Professor Flowers knows that because and is using those talking points because she knows that people aren't going to be able to call her out on it. Now, I don't know if that's actually what she did. I actually think she was probably just not as informed as she could have been and was just kind of stumbling over the right um, articulations. Um, and, and one of the ways that I saw that was when um, uh, 
uh, Dr. Heemdout had said, well, you know, I'm an immigrant and I believe that everybody has a right to live where they live, which is a, a, an idea that I agree with. And so he says, well, why can't I just live where I live? And uh, Professor Flowers says, well, because you're living on stolen land and that land is, is still stolen. And that's also true. And um, both of these uh, opinions are valid opinions to have, but neither of them fully encapsulate the nuance of what it is to be an Indigenous person repping the land back movement. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, that's that's a great base to start with. Before we continue, though, I just have to ask, there's a bit of odd feedback coming from your microphone, almost like a, oh. a hollow noise, uh, when, maybe when you bump something? Yeah, hold There, on it's being made right now. Okay, I know what it is. <laughs> I'm gonna like try. A, like a, a thermos? Second. Yeah, it's got like a little, um, here we go. This is, okay, let's do that. It's, oh, no. Shiza. <laughs> What is that? Wait, I've, I've, I cannot tell little, what that um, is. It's a little, what is it called? It's a, uh, it's like a spring. It's a little spring that keeps the tension on the different parts of it. So every time I move it, it goes, bring, bring. Oh, interesting. Okay, I yeah. would never have guessed that from the sound, but okay. Um, anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't okay. a huge deal, so I didn't mean to, to put you out or anything. I just... Uh, That's okay. Right. Um, okay, so I guess I guess I just want to open with my perspective on this, just because you sure. know, we all have our own biases. So... With, with regards to decolonization and land back, um, I talk mostly from an American perspective because mm -hmm. that's what Americans always do um, <laughs> to others' detriment sometimes. But the, as I understand the land back movement here, it feels like, you know, we had a, a, a great number of native tribes that the U.S. government lied to. We made contracts with them and then we broke them, you know, for the funsies of it. And uh, yeah. the, the reservations we have now are like a shadow of a shadow of a ghost of, of what th their, their allotments were supposed to be. So when I think of land back, I think of fulfilling the legal obligations we set out as a baseline for addressing the inequality that centuries of, of, of colonization and genocide have, have entrenched. Um, there are some things that I think are agreeable and some I don't. I do know there are people who make the argument, though I've never actually heard this from an indigenous person, that native people <laughs> have the right to take back over the United States and that lefties should advocate for that and that if you're white, you should go back to Europe. And now, I do not think yeah. that's representative of what most advocates for indigenous issues want, in part because it's very, very dumb, and I don't think that little of them. <laughs> At least I think it's dumb. And... Um, and also because it strikes me as, 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 as sort of the logic of ethno-nationalism crammed into a more socially acceptable context. That's yeah, the stuff I, I, agree. I tend to fight against, but I'm, I'm really amicable to other potential solutions. So when you think of land back in, I, I guess in Canada or, or wherever you think it's applicable, what do you think of? So I'll, I'll use my perspective um with my reservation um, actually being given a parcel of land back from the federal government as a as a thorough like thorough way here so land back to me you know my parcel of land that was redistributed back to my band and my reservation um, is a huge area it was enormous and um, part of that area includes cities it includes cities that have already been developed that have already got infrastructure that already have buildings and high schools and colleges and hospitals and yada 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 and so there's no way um for us to you know move in and say you guys all have to leave now because this is on technically our land you know so that just isn't first of all it doesn't make sense it just doesn't make sense to waste the time and effort and manpower that it would take to try and articulate something like that. First of all, I don't think any reservation has the actual power to do that. And second of all, I don't think people want to. What we prefer is that in that parcel of land, there should be a pecking order for who gets access to the resources of that land first. So if that land now belongs to us legally, there should be no reason why anybody else gets to go onto that land and 
start chopping down trees, start building roads unless we say so. And if they do want to do that without our say so, then what they have to do is pay restitutions. So it's a double sided issue. Part of the land back movement is getting access to land that hasn't been developed and taxing land that has been developed. If you're going to use resources from the land, if you're going to develop infrastructure on the land and you're going to benefit from that, there's no reason why Indigenous people, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes away from those cities shouldn't be receiving some sort of taxation from those resources, from the, the money that's made in selling and buying those resources, from the income that's generated. There shouldn't be any reason why the, why taxes can't be made for us to benefit from also so that we can be equal on an equal platform. Can I add to and that indigenous, really quick? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to say that in the U.S., um, I know that with regards to resource extraction, there are huge tracts of federal land out west, not so much east, but west, uh, you know, where we mine oil or we sell the rights to lumber, you know, stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I've heard that too, that... There are areas where companies are given the right by the federal government to just essentially take what they want. And natives, Absolutely. right, they've said like, okay, this land was ours before and it should be ours again. And the first thing we're doing is making you motherfuckers pay. You're, you're going to pay us out That's the nose right. That's right. That's right. If you want to take the land, if you, want, if you really want it that bad, you're going to pay us out. And you're going to pay us out big time and you're going to pay us out for as long as you're using it. Because there's no reason why anyone should be making millions of dollars, big money kahuna bucks, while kids on reservations are going hungry, while education is being funded 30% less, while clean water resources are being funded 30% less, and while the government is still taking land away from Native reserves. If that is still happening, there's no reason, no good reason why we shouldn't be getting ours first, you know? But 100%. to suggest that that means we go into cities where people live already and have already, you know, d like some people have been living in cities for generations. That doesn't make any sense to go into a developed city and say, all of you get out. How is that? How does that make sense? I, it just doesn't make sense to me. There's and I see <laughs> there's so many people that will, that will use that. They'll use the land back movement to be like, well, they, they should be allowed to say if they want to do it. And I'm like, yeah, sure, maybe technically, but can you not see the harm and the detriment in suggesting that Indigenous people should be allowed to do a genocide? <laughs> like, there's, it's, there's... Th there's a term for that, right? <laughs> so this is a, this is like a racist um, uh, a conspiracy theory, kind of, the fear of retribution. And yeah. it has a million, like, invocations, but generally it's the idea that, like, if we gave power to this minority group, so step one is denying the idea that the minority was ever mistreated. Step two is when it looks like they might get equal rights, you say, okay, we totally mistreated them. And also they're gonna do it to us just as yeah. bad. They're gonna do it to us worse if they get the power to, so we can't let them have that power. And I feel like, so obviously a lot of very racist groups have said that, I disagree with that, but sometimes I get the feeling there are people online who will invoke the fear of retribution as a positive like yes, yes. they will do this and you yeah. should be you should be thankful that you get to participate <laughs> in their retribution like oh wow okay <laughs> I, I think it's coming cool. from a, just a similar place of 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 ignorance actually and not in a, in a cruel kind of way i think it's just honestly that people are so uninformed about um, how Indigenous people think about land, about the land back movement. I, I, I think that, you know, especially on, on, the, on the rad left side, you'll find people who will say like, you know, you know, a lot of crazy stuff like that. And you say, okay, that's great and all, but like, do you know what you're talking about? You know, do you really know what you're talking about? You know, going onto Twitter and like, asking three or four people if they should or should not be allowed to do something is not the way to turn this conversation. The way to turn this conversation is like you're doing here is including indigenous voices in the rhetoric and allowing us the opportunity to, it's not that people are getting it so wrong. It's just, we need to smooth some wrinkles out so that people don't start 
using really inflammatory language to describe how we feel about our own problems. Yeah, it, in a way, it reminds me a lot of, um, I, I know these aren't perfectly like parallel, but um, back during the Black Lives Matter protests here in the US, when they were at their peak at least, there was this weird disconnect where the movement is ostensibly about the interests and the rights of black people and their treatment by the police and other issues. But there were people on the far left who were saying like, yeah, that's step one, but we also need socialism. And they would try mm -hmm. to put that into the movements. And look, I'm a socialist. I agree with the message, but it right. felt like it was being used as a vehicle for sometimes for other issues, which seems to me to be like essentially the opposite of what's repeated almost like dogma on the left, which is listen to the oppressed. Um, sometimes it feels like True. by listen to the oppressed, they mean listen to the oppressed people who agree with us and ignore the ones who don't. And, and I know, yeah. yeah, and I've seen that like, uh, I know I've seen that in like sometimes with the, like the black community, like sometimes black people who have more moderate voices will get shouted down by the more radical ones. And while I like the yes, discourse, yeah. I don't like the constant, almost like oppression Olympics where it's like, it, it's yeah. hard to come into a scenario where, you know, when you're on the left side, you're already dealing with the right you know you're already dealing with people who just first of all they hate you they don't want to give you the time of day to begin with and to have then to also be incorporating infighting in your rhetoric you know having to manage that because some people on the left think that you'll never be left enough is really frustrating and uh i hate it <laughs> I, I hate it so much. I imagine that must be incredibly <laughs> frustrating. I want to know, by the way, in case I can find a map, you described uh, a, a big land back gain that was received yes. recently. Is there a name associated with it that I could look up? So I don't know if I can't remember what it's called, but my my reservation or my band, it will you'll probably be able to bet, find it better that way, is Whitefish River First Nation. So they encapsulate a few different reserves, including mine. And mine is the, I think, one of the anchor style reserves. Gotcha. Um, that's a pretty logo. I, um, when, when I was in university in Northern California, I'm ashamed to admit that I don't remember details, including the names, but there were uh, a few really prominent indigenous groups in that area because Washington does oh, yeah. have, uh, yeah, they, they, there's, you know, there's a good bit of land there committed to that. And um, I, I, sometimes they would come to the university or I would talk with them. And I felt like their arguments were always really, really good. Like, I don't think yes. I ever heard a bad one, you know, but I never yeah. see those arguments thrown out in the public. It's always like the most milk toast, moderate bullshit, or yeah. it's such absurdly hyperbolic, like radical dogma that it's alienating to anyone yes. outside of that like ideological block. I, th I think the reason why that happens is because, um, at least in my experience, whenever I'm talking about um, Indigenous issues with other Indigenous people, I notice that other Indigenous people uh, tend to have this, um, this sort of spiritual rhetoric that works hand in hand with their actual um, talking points. Mm -hmm. And so when you're not from that background... Um, like if you're white, especially, and you, you, you start to see, you know, native people, you know, talking about the creator and talking about this stuff and that stuff while they're also trying to teach you about movements like the land back movement, we especially lose the, the younger crowd. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, um, self-censorship that goes on to make ourselves more, approachable and appealable to mainstream um mainstream talking points yeah no no it doesn't I, always happen but it 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 sometimes you can tell right away well i've that seen happening. that right wasn't that kind of i remember that being a big thing in the 70s at least here in the united states yeah. i wasn't around back then but i've heard it was like there was a wave of liberal sympathy for the plight of the native american but it was framed in this very weird almost like uh, noble savage That's you know they, they were yeah. closer to the land you know like like it, it, talking about like the native genocide the same way you might talk about like a deforestation or a you know a, a species of fish going extinct where it's like the beauty yes. of nature has been soiled but it's like i th this you might disagree with me on this but from what i've read 
on the many, many native tribes here in the United States. I feel like a lot of the narrative of them being more in touch with nature and blah, blah, blah. I feel like a lot of that, from what I've read, is horseshit. That they would- It depends. It, there, there were elements of it. Uh, certainly, I mean, obviously the Europeans came over with a much more antagonistic attitude towards land ownership and stuff like that. But they, they were mythologized to these like near, like deific, like almost like you guys are like dryads or like satyrs or so. We, we were like, yeah. yeah. And it's like, well, you know, I, I've seen like these Twitter takes you wouldn't believe like before Europeans, like there was no rape in the Americas. Like, what do you talking about like they never yeah. did war <laughs> what are you talking no, about they're people there was, there, we literally have songs and dances and drumming circles f to four warriors one of the biggest things in ojibwe culture is that the opening of every i don't know if every powwow but in on the powwow on my reserve we open with the song ogichita kway which is the warrior woman it's the warrior woman song and in, uh, in ojibwe culture we honor our women specifically, like we were big on treating women and men as equals. And so we honor our women at the powwows by introducing them through song first, but it's warrior woman. And we, we have this concept about like war is a, <laughs> war is a pretty big like thing culturally for indigenous communities. Like, I don't know why anyone would think that we didn't have war. And also, you know, the, the a lot of the core foundations in the way that America's um, legal system is set up is based off of indigenous tribes managing war and how they managed each other's different parties and how people would be allowed to, if you were from this warring state and that warring clan, you would come together in one house and you would both be allowed a time to speak and you would both be allowed an audience to, to air out your grievances. And that became one of the foundations of American law. And that happened because there was war. <laughs> like It didn't happen because everybody liked each other all the time. I think the big failing of that liberal sympathy that I was talking about was that it it put a lot of native people, I think, in in a museum. It infantilizes us. Right, you're you're it you're a it Disney. infantilizes us. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're like a Disney trope. Yeah. It, it is well because people, real living, breathing people, are in addition to being generally shitty at times, I think, um, political problems that have to be dealt with immediately. All people, any yeah. group, any ethnicity, but you know, mystical forest wisdom people. Well, that's more of an abstract concept that isn't necessarily directly derivative of Native Americans. So you could go, you yeah. know, it doesn't it, really have to. It can be. Uh, the issue, I think the issue is that it can be like, like, especially amongst our elders, you know, the way my elders speak, uh, I don't know that they would be happy to have a political discussion like this because it's just not conducive to their their way of speech and their way of understanding it and their experience and, and perception of the world. And part of that perception is that very classically hokey pokey spirits and all this kind of stuff, you know, uh, rhetoric, like it does come up and you see it less in young people because, you know, we're going to scare you off. If we do that, you're going to look at us like we're, first of all, like we're, you know, a museum exhibit because it's so difficult for modern society to take, you know, spiritual dogmatism seriously, which is fair. I think that's that's I think that's reasonable for young people to as, well, any person rather to um, to feel that way. But if our culture and our rights to land and our rights to our heritage are so closely intertwined with the way we perceive the world, um, I think, you know, why is it so hard for everybody to kind of be okay with that? You don't do anything like that to black people. You don't take, you know, black culture and say like, oh, it, yeah, you know, yeah, we got to help, you know, black people. But if only they'd stop with the hokey pokey weirdness and only if they'd stop listening to like rap music. Like, no, you don't say that. You accept that black culture is what is defined by black people. And the same needs to happen, I think, for Indigenous people in order for them to start getting comfortable enough to, to really opining on it. So, okay, I think that's really interesting because um, I've gotten a little bit in trouble over this before, and I guess I want your opinion on it. So I would be one of those younger people who's very off-put by spirituality. 
I find yes, those arguments yeah. unconvincing, and I think that if you start to factor in perspectives like that, then you start to talk about like, okay, well, do does, do 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 the Israelis have a moral right to their territory because of their thousands of years old, you know, story on this, that, or the other, and like it, it circles back to a lot of stuff. And I know that there are arguments for land back, which have to do with like the the, the inherent tie to the land that some native groups have, That's like correct, spiritually. Yeah. Now, I'll admit, I've never cared about any of these arguments. I do care about restitution, equality, you know, uh, righting of injustices, stuff like that. But mm -hmm. for me, I've always been a little concerned that, and uh, this could just be my biases, but um, that the, the advocacy for it along spiritual lines almost undercuts the real political project because I think you can make a very, very strong secular argument for the land back that you advocated before. Not because, like, you're spiritual tied to the land, but because it was your fucking land. I mean, you don't have to spiritually justify, like, theft as a concept. You can That's just... That's right, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. So most people, are, I've noticed, too, you know, we're very we're very happy to articulate the land back movement without involving the spiritual aspect of it because it can be separated. Um, but you'll notice that indigenous people will have a lot more to say if they are given the opportunity to include some of those spiritual aspects. And it's the same as like, if I'm not saying it's right, but it's the same as, you know, if you went into town and you burned down the church, right? Mm -hmm. That would make Christian people unhappy. And in the same way, when indigenous people see the government stealing ceremonial grounds for fasting, for instance, like we have a we have a fasting ground on my reservation. And if it came about, you know, tomorrow that some company was going to bust in there and, and, you know, tear it apart, you know, of course, my of course, the right to keep the land because it's our land takes hold above anything else. But personally, knowing that they were attacking a, a spiritual monument to us is like extra salt in the wound. And I think it's, I think it's hard for um, non-Indigenous people to engage in this conversation because we're so closely tied to our culture, knowing that it was, uh, that so much of it was eradicated and that we're scrambling so hard to just keep hold of of what we can at this point and and doing a really great job of it and fighting the good fight but that's a really hard sell to the secular world it's a really hard sell to go to young people and say like yeah you know you should you should do what um, indigenous people tell you to do because they're on the red path they're walking the path they're they're doing the healing they're doing the ceremonies and stuff like that it's it's not an easy thing to do but the reason it's also important is because our culture and our cultural practices are one of the few things in society that works conducively with indigenous people to help them heal from intergenerational trauma and being attached to those rhetorics and those teachings and those historical sites and those uh, spiritual attitudes is helping our people more than any other service in Canada is. Okay. I think that two points. I think that makes a lot of sense, you know. Even if you were to speak of it explicitly in secular terms, when you're talking about restitution in like a a, a court case for damages, sentimental mm -hmm. value is one of those factors, right? I mean, even if you're talking about nothing religious or, or inherently culturally valuable, you could be talking about the value of like a a, a piece of property that belongs here, great, great, this, that, or the other. Stuff like that is factored in, even in secular cases. So it seems logical then that even if I don't buy the spiritual argument, the importance, the spiritual importance of uh, of, of of the land or of other tangential stuff, you know, um, yeah. th it, you can recognize that no matter what. Like, because, like, for instance, if um, if there was a court case and somebody had an heirloom from the 1700s, like. And, and they got really mad that it was 
lost or destroyed or stolen you know i don't mm -hmm. have to ha i don't have to get why they cared about it to recognize that there's some special absolutely. importance there that can be absolutely yeah. you don't have to understand it you just have to respect it if you, you don't have to believe in you know the spiritual rhetoric and dogmatism that surrounds indigenous cultures but for pete's sake would it kill you to just be a little polite you know if we want to talk about it <laughs> i i actually I, saw online there was once i don't know if it was real or not but a story of a parent saying that to punish their kid, they deleted a Minecraft world that their kid had oh worked my on gosh. for a long time. Now, I would an, kill my mom. <laughs> in an objective sense, that Minecraft world is literally worthless. But the internet went to an uproar, and clearly you understand why. I, so, yeah. Like, yeah. So if we can agree, if we can agree that the subjective value of a Minecraft world is worthy of an internet backlash, then I guess you can probably make a pretty strong argument for, I don't know, thousands and thousands of years of cultural heritage tied to the landmarks of the region that you... Uh, yeah. yeah. I think it, it does play an interesting debate too, you know, when you're talking, as if you want to, you know, bring what's happening in, with Israel and Palestine into it, it, it can be a slippery slope, right? It, it, it doesn't take much for things to get absolutely haywire right out of the bat. And... Um, I think that's one of the other reasons why um, the general public doesn't want to get too into uh, talking about native issues, because first of all, in North America, um, if you come here and you, you're here as a settler or even as an immigrant, there's this understanding that, you know, you might own your house, you might rent an apartment, you might own your car, but you don't own the land. The land doesn't belong to you. And when we think about it in terms of uh, from that perspective of, of being a settler or an immigrant, the, the federal government owns the land and uses it to um, put houses on top of it and you can own the house. That's, that's kind of the rhetoric. And so it's very, very difficult to try and opine on subjects about land when the opposing party doesn't have the same history with land that you do. Um, like I used to struggle as a teenager trying to articulate to adults why we should keep our land. I have people say to me like, well, why don't you just move? Why don't you give it up? Why do you have to have the land? And it's because that land is tied to every aspect of our person in a way that settlers and immigrants don't have the capacity to do so because they don't own land. It would be the same as if you went to somebody's house that was there for generations and generations and you kicked, kicked the people in there out of it and said, this is our house now. And imagine how, how the, the degree of displacement that would cause, you know, and pe I think people don't realize it's still happening. You know, it, I, even though our reservation received a huge parcel of land back, which is, is really fabulous, it wasn't more than 10 years ago that people were still stealing chunks of it away. We're still parceling it off into golf courses and and making backdoor deals with, you know, municipalities to get, you know, get reelected as as, you know, chiefs or whatever and using land as a as a bribe for that. Like that still happens. So I don't I don't get the rhetoric where people I don't know. I'm bringing, I guess that's a different issue, but <laughs> well, well, it's all related. Right. And I mean, I get that. And honestly, yeah. I think a lot of people, including myself, I'm always going to be averse to the spiritualism, but cultural sentimentality, I understand. I mean, yeah, imagine, like Stonehenge for the English or Taj Mahal or if you even if you just want to yeah. talk about like just purely the land, the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon. Oh, my is gosh. A, right. right. This is it's like Americana. That's a good distilled. one, though, because the that's actually let's let's get into that because that's actually a really interesting topic let's talk about um mount rushmore oh, so yeah mount, i've heard uh, i've heard a controversy about that one in, right in, in so time. mount rushmore was originally um of um not a, maybe not a well i'm sure it was a spiritual location at one point but it was called something else i think it was called the something grandfathers the uh the anyway the we believe that mountains are quote unquote grandfathers like metaphorically mm -hmm. so those are like old those are the oldest spirits that that ever spirited right and so they're like very significant to us each mountain is very important we put a lot of um importance on types of mountains and then settlers came and carved a bunch of faces into them and then called those mountains theirs and completely erased any cultural history and significance that was had by 
indigenous people for that location. And now there's a push, so I've heard, that people want to reclaim Mount Rushmore um, under the reservation, the band that previously it was associated to. And I think that's a really interesting question because that falls into the line of like, if Indigenous people don't have the right to do a genocide, do we have a right to dismantle symbols of colonialism, even if they're long-standing beloved symbols? You know, Look, it's I am like totally on board with you ethically, but pragmatically, I think the American people would sooner vote to tactically nuclear strike every reservation in our borders <laughs> I think so too. than they than they would I be willing so. to give up the 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 Mount Rushmore. Look, if Absolutely. Not, if nothing else, <laughs> it's it you can use it as like a condemnation of our creativity because you referred to the mountains as grandfathers on their own, but we had to literally carve faces onto them like children to refer to them as our yeah. founding fathers. <laughs> We had to, we're, we're too yeah. literal. We had to like, we, the metaphor didn't work with us. Okay. We had to actually yeah, sit down literal. there and physically carve them in. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm totally on board with the, with the, with the spirit and sentiment though. I've always found like, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I swear to God, I'm not doing this to virtue signal. I think Mount Rushmore is really <laughs> ugly. I have never cared about Mount Rushmore. <laughs> It's, it's not even that I hate the Founding Fathers or whatever. I mean, maybe I do, but for different reasons. I just think that, I just I just think it's ugly. I just do not get the appeal. I don't know. I feel, I do feel it's a little tacky. It's tacky. Like, it's tacky. It's a little tacky, right? Like, like, I get that like Egypt has the pyramids and India has the Taj Mahal and like everybody's got their thing. And I guess America was like really excited about you know, colonizing the whole of North America and, and really wanted to swing their dicks around. But, you know, come on, you know, faces, giant faces of old people. You I'm not saying why? this would have been any better for indigenous people. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> if you want to celebrate the ancestry of our country or heritage or whatever, for however far back that goes, like, employ some metaphor. What if they had carved yeah. the entire <laughs> face of the mountain so that one half of it was rocky and craggy like normal? And the other half was just a perfectly smooth facade upon which like yeah. the outline of the American borders were traced or something. Do I like, don't know. Do you mean like in Fooly Cooly how there's those giant irons that are always looming in the background ready to iron Don't over bring the Fooly Cooly up with me. Okay. We already like you enough. You don't need to lead it in. Okay. We are. You've already won the crowd. You don't need to, you don't need to bring it, bring it home like that. Uh, but yes, honestly, if they had just carved it into a gigantic ironing thing and been like, hey guys, in a hundred years, this anime will come out and l listen, okay, it's going to be My sick gosh, as shit. could you imagine? My mind would be exploding. Uh, um, It'd be amazing. It, um, <laughs> in, in all, in all seriousness, um, I do totally get the, the cultural argument for all that, you know? We're talking about like yeah. landmarks and all that. And I think, I don't know, cause like when, when we talk about like the, the attachment certain tribes have to the land and I'm just kind of guessing here, but I'm guessing it's like for a thousand years, the waterfall has been over there. And there are just like traditions associated with that waterfall. And that right there is the mountain face. And you can tell that the thing happens when the sun goes over. Or it's like, like traditions associated with the particular geography yeah, so I'll get I'll get into that because I actually have personal experience with that. Yeah. So this will sound a little extreme, mm -hmm. but um, I was I found I'm very happy about this, and I hope to do it again sometime. But um, on my reservation, in my culture, you reach a certain age, you go on your vision quest, right? Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I was, I was 11 years old. I went on top of our fasting mountain called Dreamers Rock, which is a, a, a beautiful place. And uh, you sit on the top of the mountain and you don't eat anything for as long as you can. You drink some water and maybe you get to have a crazy vision and then you go home. And um, I don't necessarily is it, believe. Is it in this... water or is it water, by the way? Just curious. Oh, no, it's just plain water. Just okay. plain water. Okay, just, just the curious. Only, the right. only other thing that you're allowed to have is um, is your your medicines, your um, your smudging medicines, which... I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk on that too much because I'm not a, a medicine person. So you have to get information from about that stuff more directly from them. Mm -hmm. But suffice it to say um, that I did the whole kit and caboodle and yada, yada, yada. And um, I don't necessarily agree with the entire spiritual aspect of it. Like, I really don't believe that if I go up onto a mountain and, like, starve myself that I'm going to receive, like, a literal message from God. <laughs> but what 
that did for me was it solidified my experience as an Indigenous person and it also solidified my relationship to um, my grandmother who took me on this journey and it solidified my relationship to my land, to my reservation. So I have a, a an unbreakable bond now with myself as an Indigenous person, with my family as an Indigenous person, and with my land as an Indigenous person. And that's not something that can be bought. That's something that it's it's infallible. I, I you know, when I go through life, especially because I'm half white, um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna get a lot of that's okay. I'm so, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm sorry. I was just, just, I was, I was, I was, <laughs> so I'm going to go through a, a lot of, um, a lot of times with indigenous people, knowing that I have to step aside, knowing that I have to, you know, humble myself or lower myself or, or stifle my voice a little bit because I don't have the full encapsulation of the indigenous perspective at my, um, at, at my usage, but my, um, my cultural practice of my vision quest has solidified that for me in a way that can't be deterred and is not something that I can cheap out on or I can't cheap myself out on. I think um, I, I always have that I always have that innate aversion to 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 mysticism, but I think that um, so this is just a, a feeling that I have, you know. In, in Durkheim was a sociologist. And he didn't think of religion as something inherently spiritual. He thought of it as a kind of social practice which distinguishes between sacred and profane things, a sort of collective group ritualization. It yes. doesn't, yeah, it, it can it can be football. It doesn't have to be uh, anything that's necessarily religious. So in, in that sense, I think religiosity is all around us. There's a, mysticism I tend to be disfavorable towards because it, to me it's in, inextricable from a lot of and I'm sure you have similarly bad opinions of what Christianity oh, has yeah. done to it. Right, right, right. Oh, so yeah. I, I see what stuff like that can do. But what you're describing past the mysticism, what I see in it, at least this is just my opinion, is a kind of cultural religiosity in the Durkheimian sense where we're talking about rituals and practices that we engage in that can connect us to a, to a country, to the land, to a community, uh, whether or not you believe in the spiritualism so for Absolutely. example yeah depending yeah. on where you live in like in um like for example in los angeles this sounds really really like trivial in in comparison but one of the things that los angeleans are really happy about is our um street tacos or like any kind of street food that you can get depending on where mm -hmm. you are in la it can be amazing and people will talk about undergoing that the process of experiencing that in a way which, while not as significant, feels to me similar to what you're describing, which is there's something locked within the land and the community in a place. And That's whether, right, yeah. right, and you can connect to that. And I do feel more connected to LA when I do stuff like that than mm -hmm. when I do what, what I do most of the time, which is sit at home, play video games. You know, that, that doesn't now, give me that it, profound yeah, sense it, of connection. It, it is important to, to um, distinguish between. Um, myself and other Indigenous people in this regard, because mm -hmm. most other Indigenous people that I know personally actually do not feel the way that I feel about it. Most Indigenous people that I've met who, the, the way that we phrase it, who are, are walking the red path, we're following the very spiritual path and, you know, engaging with the mysticism and, and so on and so forth. They don't feel the same way that I do. And in fact, they're they're very, very um, protective of whatever mysticism is available to them in those cultural practices. And um, I think that's fine, too. People are allowed to engage with spirituality, with mysticism, if they want. That's their right. Um, but I don't personally, and I think that's an important distinction to make here, because that's one of the ways in which I do not represent um, a large portion of Indigenous people. You know, many Indigenous people feel very strongly um, about um, about these spiritual practices because they, you know, in the same way, in the same way that people go to church and pray and really feel something from praying and not necessarily from um, 
from going to church, but it, in prayer specifically, like they feel something from that. Uh-huh. Um, that's something that, that I don't have because I don't believe that there's a big man in the sky watching over me. And because I don't believe there's a big man in the sky watching over me, I can't get on board with every and all spiritual, uh, practice that's available to me as an indigenous person. Can I, can I ask you then what you think about my perspective on this? Well, I think it's, I don't think it's an unreasonable perspective. I think everybody has the right to decide their own, um, you know, to self-actualize their own um, beliefs. But I wonder, I really think that, you know, out of everything that we've been doing to shit all over Native people, I think that trying to tell them that they're you know, their goofy hijinks is a little too out there is probably it's just not the right time, you know, give them the land back and then start taxing some people. And then maybe it's time to open up a better discourse about whether or not their kooky shenanigans are appropriate or inappropriate. Yeah, let them become a powerful (laughs) magnate, you know, with with, with, uh, yeah, two two thirds of the the world's oil controlled in their territory. And then we can. That's right. Especially because, yeah, if you if you think about um, if you think about Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the largest resources that that we have available to people suffering from addiction. Mm -hmm. But there are people who are left out of Alcoholics Anonymous because they're not on board with the uh, religious dogmatism that's included in one of those steps, right? Yeah. And it's it's a similar thing with, with Indigenous culture. When, if you deny... Um, indigenous people the right to participate in that mysticism, you're going to inevitably hurt some of the people who are most at risk in suffering um, from addiction, in suffering from abuse, neglect, and any of the of the traumas that have been trickling down upon us. And that mysticism really helps our communities and keeps the bond really strong and I think is a cause for good in the long run but I should hope that as time goes on I get to one day meet more indigenous people like myself who are a little too pragmatic for their own good I um okay I think I totally get that it it feels to me a little bit like um almost like my feeling on Mecca in, in a way right like I'm not, mm-hmm. right, I'm not Muslim. Uh, it, you can like Google Mecca, and there are people doing you know big circles around it, and I don't yep. get it. And oh, honestly, yeah. I don't care. But if someone like bombed Mecca, I I I I would be outraged on behalf of them, uh, yeah. Because even if I don't, even if I don't think there's any relationship between that box and the metaphysical, I do think that it's enormously important to people. And even if I, I dis, sometimes just don't believe it and sometimes outright disagree with some of the spiritualism associated with it, mm-hmm. that doesn't change the fact that, I mean, whether religion is a part of it or not, you know, things have been important to people for, for as long as people have been around. And I yeah. think it's worthwhile to fight for those things. I agree. And I think, I think one of the issues, too, going back to talking about you know, one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of engagement in debating uh, from a lot of indigenous people or the people that you do hear it from seem really reasonable and really, you know, on point is because we know that this aspect to our society is super off-putting to especially the left, you know, especially to people who are secular, especially to people who think that the church should be dismantled, which I would love to see. But, you know, like, it's a really hard sell to those people when you say, yeah, I'm native and I want the land back and everything like that. They're like, yeah. And, and then you're like, also, I think we should be allowed to, you know, do our spiritual things in the way that we want to do them. And people are like, wait, 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 spiritual things like God and whatever. And you're like, yeah, some of us want to do that. Um, is that okay? And they're like, oh, I mean, I guess, I don't know. It's kind of (laughs) icky. Right. To a lot of people, it delegitimizes a claim. That's right. In in a way that it it wouldn't if we were talking about another religious group, maybe. Like if we were talking about like uh, Christians here in America and they're like, yeah, we really care about this place because this is where, you know, this guy, this... I don't know anything about Christianity. We we would I think we would assign <laughs> we would assign like more meaning 
to their uh, to 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 the the mysticism associated with their claim. Mm -hmm. Then we I do think the to other a lot reason, of natives. I th I think. Yeah, I think the reason for that is because Christianity and Catholicism in general are the type of mysticism that is most commonly accepted in our society. You know, when when somebody like think about somebody making a toast at dinner, how utterly offended would you actually be if somebody was like? Uh, thank God for these two people getting married today. Here you hear like you, zero. right? You like don't, not a, yeah, you don't like, think anything of it, right? You yeah. don't you don't think anything of it. But when a native person is in a similar circumstance in front of a group of white people or secular people and raises their glass and says, "In the great Gitche Manitou, we trust." Thank you so much for this unification. People are like, "What the fuck's Gitche Manitou? Is that some weird native?" Be, they would stuff? be loading their muskets before they finish. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. No, I, t I so, completely get that. It's 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 cultural it's sort of like Christianity. They, yeah, they 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 hear the 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 um the spiritual religiosity of it, and they're like, oh, that's that weird stuff that I don't like that I recognize. But they don't get the Christian sense of it that they do recognize, and therefore are feeling even more separated from it. Yeah. It's the, it, you know, it's the, uh, I don't believe in a God, but Jesus is the God I don't believe yeah, in. Yeah, that's right. It, right, right. Like, I celebrate Christmas. I'm not Christian. I've never been Christian. I celebrate Christmas. Mm -hmm. When I see Christmas trees all up over the place, I don't even think about it. It's practically secularized. At least it is to me. Christian people don't yeah. secularize it. They, they care a whole hell of a lot about, what was it, the day Christ died? Or was that Easter? No, that was when he was born. He was born on Christmas. Yeah, right? Easter he rose again. Christmas yeah. he was born. Yeah. So yeah. clearly there's there's a there's a bias in the extent to which we're off put by mm -hmm. by by spiritualism we don't believe in depending on whether yeah. it comes from hegemonically Christian groups or or you know uh, native groups I think. Yeah, no it's true. It's true for certain. Yeah. One of the other issues that um I wanted to bring up as well was um so Let's go back to talking about the um, BLM movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, and how that affected, <laughs> and how that affected um, indigenous um, talk, uh, indigenous issues. So, on the one hand, um, when Black Lives Matter started gaining some traction, there was a um, around the same time uh, we were all making the case to change the Washington football uh, logo and team name from its incredibly offensive. Um, icon that I have been staring at as an indigenous person my entire life mm -hmm. to something that, you know, maybe didn't shit all over native people. And part of that happened because there was a rising in social awareness as part of the Black Lives Matter movement, because, you know, people were starting to see like, oh, you know, if people are making some noise about something, they're not just going to go away. They're just going to kind of get re like really big and like make a lot of noise and stuff and so maybe we should just you know nip this washington thing in the bud and just change the logo which is great but on the other hand especially in canada which is a little bit more removed from black lives matter than america is um at the same time that black lives matter was starting to gear up there was something happening up here with a reservation being built a, a they were building a, a pipeline through it um which is a big no-no obviously you would fucking think um and it was called um we stand with wetsuitin mm -hmm. and at the time it it was almost completely obliterated in the media because it just could not compare with the wave that was black people coming together to start you know, bringing this issue to light. And we, we just got completely lost in the rhetoric, just absolutely drowned out. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that um, we should be uplifting each other as much as possible. But I do also want to point out that it's often, I, I just, I, I'm trying to understand why it is that there are minorities who are in a position of authority and power over indigenous people seem to want to really ignore that and don't want to speak to that and don't want to say that that's happening. The, the, in this, in the imbalanced allocation of, um, of social capital. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes, yes. So, like, for instance, you know, um, like, black culture is huge in America. It's mm-hmm. enormous in America. It's well, not as big in Canada. It's like the only culture we have, actually. <laughs> but it's, ex- it, exactly. Yeah. And indigenous culture, even if you think about what you see in the media, is is a smidgen of that. It's it's just a pittance compared to um, to black cultures, you know, big big beautiful blackness, which we love. But it does undercut, you know, sometimes issues for indigenous people. And again, it's not that that's a bad thing. But in the case of somebody like Professor Flowers. Oh my goodness, can you not understand how sometimes not good it looks to be a minority in a position of of greater like social capital than indigenous communities and then using indigenous talking points to try and justify you know your own ends? I just <laughs> I really had a problem with that. That that was the point where I was like yelling at the TV while I was watching it, and I went and grabbed my laptop and emailed you. I was like, no, this needs to get sorted out. This can't happen. No. The thing that's been really frustrating is that outside of, well, I guess my community, which is admittedly pretty large, so I, you know, that means something. But outside of that, the left mostly seemed to side with Professor Flowers. Uh, it I seemed was really shocked yeah, by to default. See that. Yeah. I think part of it is just, like, on the left, we tend to just defer to minority voices, like, whether or not yeah. they're correct, and I am a white boy. Um, mm-hmm. And I think part of it is probably a bias against me, which I'll accept. But I honestly, I think a lot of it... <sighs> okay, maybe you can tell me if you think <laughs> no, I'm overstepping there, yeah. with this. <laughs> honestly, I think a lot of people on the left feel unironic, conservative, stereotyped white guilt. I think they recognize that they're the benefactors of a very destructive power hierarchy. And rather than like address that in like a responsible or holistic way, instead they what they do is they absorb all of the liberal like fear mongering over yeah. fear of retribution. Mean, uh, and they go you mean Yeah, like, actually. Um, <laughs> do you mean like do you mean like those white people in the latest Channel Five News with Andrew Callahan who were literally just giving money? to uh saddam the black co-host because he was at their rally for uh <laughs> reparations i for haven't black seen people. that but if that's what oh happens i know what i'm that's watching what happened, we're done right? with this stream that- <laughs> that's what yes! happened man the uhuru Mar- yes that's right this guy yeah. gazi Koso, like that? <laughs> he tried to come on my stream once but this dude is a hardcore grifter so i don't know he just wants attention i should have done it anyway he's good memes um yeah, yeah. white people show up at this sh- and there there's um they have like a payment system on their website where they're like, uh, yeah, you know, if you're white, this is the first step to fixing racism. OK, you got to you got to go sign up for the the white boy pledge. And it's yeah. like, eight bucks or something. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. It's great. They um, uh, they did a little expose on it where they were like, so anyway, these guys took the money and then they went and built a basketball court in like saint somewhere on the other side of the country and shit and like how is that benefiting people in in oakland oklahoma wherever it was the dude <laughs> the dudes they're doing this for those gazi kutso guys i think they're i think they're basically nazis they're like really anti-semitic and they they're they're like reverse nazis there's you know it's like all the yeah. all the tropes and talking points just flipping the script on who's the benefactor yeah. and who's the yeah but um yeah but no, I, I unfortunately, and this, I, there's no way for me to say this without sounding like conservative. I mean, I'm literally like sitting here, like you lefties are full of white guilt. But I, I yeah. honestly think that I it think gets there's in a lot the of way. It. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it hurts there's a lot of it. The advocacy. And I, I find that it goes two ways. That it's you know either you you start to feel like a shitty person for being white, and you start to think like, oh my god, you know all these things are happening and I'm having a good time and and that's kind of messed up. And you either go like super hard rad liberal or you go super hard conservative because you can either deny, deny, deny what is happening and the icky gross feelings that you're feeling or they just lean way too hard on the opposite end of the spectrum and think that they have to flagellate themselves in order to get, you know, get the point across. I just think it's such a disservice that it, don't be afraid to talk to people. Don't be afraid to talk to minorities like they're on your level. Like, stop trying to divide yourself from them. 
and that goes that goes everywhere i get that i get that black people especially have a a, a long hard past behind them between them and white people and that makes them unwilling or nearly unable to effectively you know engage with white people i get that okay I, I really do and to express how i get that let me explain something to you even though i am half white i am still fucking half native and there are still people in my country who would have no problem saying to my face that they think i should get run over if i'm protesting on a highway they have no problem calling me a dirty fucking native they have no problem making all and any kind of assumption about me based off of my background. They have no problem treating me differently. You know, nothing, not, they, no, no fucks given. So I get that in the long history of dealing with shit every day from white people, you are disinclined to engage with them. But the truth of the matter is we're all adults now. This is not kindergarten anymore. You have to accept that we live on this planet with people we think are fucking assholes. And at one point or another, you're going to have to figure out a productive way to engage with these people. Because if you don't, if you leave them to their own devices, they're just going to get worse. And they're just going to make more problems for you in the long run. Oh, I completely agree. The people, yeah. the people who I, like, the, the frustration I have most here is with the self-hating white groups. Because... In my experiences, like doing activism work or talking with like uh, BLM people or going outside and talking to real human beings who don't live on Twitter, it's that <laughs> overwhelmingly, I think that like the vast majority of like indigenous people have good opinion, you know, maybe like not perfectly politically cogent opinions. That's not everyone right. can have those. But for the most part, like a good set of opinions on these issues and black people with theirs and so on. Again, not perfect. Just generally, I think that they're well, they're not on Twitter, and that's their benefit. The issue yeah. <laughs> is that there's this performative need to distance yourself from any semblance of chauvinism on the left, which leads yeah. to men being constant apologists for the for like for for themselves, or like they're they're yeah. always like, "Sorry for being a guy." Cis people do this, white people do this, and what that means is that you encourage an atmosphere not of anti-racism or anti-sexism but rather of who has the most performatively anti-hegemonic oppressive God, opinion yes. perspective. God, and what yes. that means is you get perspectives like, actually, we should kick all white people out of America, no matter yep. how stupid or unproductive or antithetical it actually is to native groups. So- No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I don't know. And <laughs> let me also say like, uh, as an indigenous person, <laughs> I'm, I'm so exhausted by seeing that rhetoric. Like, the the amount of stuff I, i'm a little i'm a little anachronistic i still like scroll on facebook i i don't know how to use tiktok like i, I don't know those, those stuff <laughs> so Keep you know up. you get a lot of those pictures that come through on the feed or whatever and they're always like they're always white people posting which I appreciate the engagement, but it's always white people posting, you know, stuff like the bodies are piling up still underneath the churches and the government of Canada is mean to native people. And it's like, yes, it's true. And I'm happy that you're engaging, but I'm tired. I'm tired. You know, I see it every day in my life and I don't need to watch the kindergartners come in with picket signs in order for me to know what's wrong with my society. And I feel bad because I want to help, you know, I want to be nice and I want to be like, yeah, your heart's in the right place. But half of the time, I just want to take them and say, shut up, just shut up. Just go do something, go bake a cake, you know, go make some bagels. I don't know, learn to sew do something else with your time other than putting all of this emotional energy into reminding me that I still don't get to live in a fair society. Do you <laughs> think it's like, um, do you think it's kind of like a, um, like, like a virtue signal thing where you think that it's mostly being invoked because it's part of a broader package of like self identifying as a progressive and the reason they post it has more Some to do with people it is. Yeah, I, I have yeah. met people like that, and I have. I, I it's so toxic. I've start. I had to unfollow. Um, I had a really good friend that she's. She is still a nice person, but the the rhetoric is just so toxic because she's more concerned about getting everything perfectly a hundred percent right than she is in being a reasonable human being who's capable of having a nuanced fucking discussion about politics. I just. 
can't. <laughs> no, and I understand but, what you like, mean. Sometimes it is, but but most of the time it's not. I think most of the time it is just people they want to help. They want to know that especially as beneficiaries of a society that has been built off of the subjugation of other races, they want to know that there's something they can do, something they can say that will somehow make this easier for us. Um, I don't think there's that many people who are doing it to be, you know, smelling their own buttholes, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Not, not maliciously necessarily, but yeah. I do know there is that pressure, right? I, like, I can say from oh, personal God, experience, yeah. there are people out there, like on Twitter and the left or whatever, who are screaming like, you know, land back, fuck 12, defund the police. And if you ask them what these things mean or how to do them, they will stare at you with an empty, just just a completely blank expression. Sometimes they'll yeah. get angry at you, actually. Like, they, oh, yeah. they interpret that as, say, a, they'll as get a angry, threat. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> why would you even question? Why would you even question this? You know? Yeah, like, it's, uh, it, it becomes dogma. But you can never you can never actually get any of this shit done with dogma, right? Maybe if you have yeah. overwhelming public opinion behind you, but not with, like, native issues. Man. Most Americans think yeah. of native people as, like, a... Like, like the way people think of Vikings. Like, like it's like a yeah. historical Absolutely. culture that you can respect in the abstract by learning the lessons of the past, as opposed yeah. to real people alive today. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. I, the, gosh, I, I had I had a person once, a young girl. I was in high school with her. And um, for those, if, if there's anybody in, in, like, the audience who still doesn't, for some reason, quite understand what systemic racism looks like, I'll give you an example here. Systemic racism is when you're an indigenous person, you're living off your reservation because you can't afford to live on your reservation because there's no jobs, there's no way for your parents to make money, Um so you have to go to a high school where there's no native language classes except for one. And if you want to take this native language class, there's one class per semester and it always conflicts with an academic course, a mandatory academic course. So you can take native lesson native language classes if you take applied academic courses. If you take um, college level courses, I'm not sure what they would call them in the States, right? But there's, uh, there's, that, that there's fits, I think. right, academic and applied. So if you want to take um, um, an indigenous language class and you want to take academic math, which is a, a necessary pro, uh, course that you have to take, you can't take it. You have to take applied math. You have to lower your standards for education in order to incorporate your culture into um into your fucking lifestyle and one of the, i was dealing with this issue and i'm complaining about it to one of my friends and she actually had the balls the pure ignorant balls to look me in the face and say oh morgan why do you even bother it's a dead language and that's how people think of indigenous culture they honest to god think that we are like a dying breed that is just there for show like we're just there to give them a fucking hard time about existing and for no other reason. Well, you fail to take into account the fact that, um, you know, for us European descendant folks, uh, making indigenous people's lives worse is part of our culture. <laughs> so really, uh, you know, are, are, are not are not we both uh, engaging in the same behavior, me thinks? Um, no, can, that... Yeah. <laughs> That really does suck. I don't think a lot of people have a good intuitive understanding of no. what it feels like to live in a country or an area that doesn't prioritize you unless you've experienced yeah. it yourself, you know? It's also, um, there's another thing I want to bring up if, if, um, if you wouldn't mind. I do want to talk a bit about like, so, so in black culture, you know, the, the government doesn't articulate your blackness for you. Right. The media does and society does. And those, you know, those factions will say or make you feel as if, if, you know, for instance, if you're a lighter skinned black person that you don't get, you know, the same room on on the table because of your inherent whiteness. Right. That's that's something that happens in you see it in movies and TV shows and you see it in um, in rhetoric amongst social groups. But native people have an art an articulated concept of of race quantity 
which is upheld by our government. And that puts us in a different position from other minorities because we have a we share a very specific relationship with the federal government that other minorities do not. And I think that's one of the things that most people are the most uninformed on because that's not something that that we see in any other social structure in North America. Nobody nobody has a card that says if you're black enough, but I have a card that says if I'm native enough or not. Yeah, I think um as I understand it that th this is called the the blood quantum, right? The um Yes, that's right. This was but, this was something we uh, did, right? Like like you guys Sorry, you guys like native people, like native people. Um, <laughs> yes. You, right. We, we, you know, we, we, uh, I nearly said the term corralled. I'm trying to, I feel like using the term well, genocide over and did, over gets rather, <laughs> yes, yes. In the, in a, we, we did a lot of bad stuff. Okay. And we needed some kind of categorization and native groups were like, whatever you're going to do probably is not going to be in line with how we think of ourselves. And America was like, you're right. Here's, here's the, the, the calipers to measure your skull. And here is the blood test. Congratulations. Now we have a way of yeah. determining whether or not you belong. That's basically but, what happened, right? Yeah. But there's an interesting, like, think of it this way. Like, I have full status. I have full unequivocal status. You can have half status. I think you can have a quarter status, but I'm not sure. Um, but I don't have either of those. I have full status, which means my children will automatically um, be status uh, Indians on my reserve, as per the Indian Act of Canada. Um, but I'm only half native. So my blood quantum is not the association that justifies my inherent ability to recognize myself as an indigenous person through Canada's government. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, so the way that, you know, the way that indigenous people articulate their quantity of race is very different, um, from from black culture and from other cultures in general right. you know you know th there's this like i'm not the greatest native to you know bring on to a discussion about stuff like this but i'm still pretty decent i'm still pretty reasonable and that doesn't have to do with my blood that has to do with my experience as an indigenous person that has to do with my upbringing the way i was raised the way i was treated you know, it has more to do with that than it has to do with how I actually look, for instance. Yeah, it's well, I mean, you may not agree with well, I doubt there's I doubt there's any issue you could find every native person would agree on. I mean, you know, especially every, what with yeah, the whole, every every res is different too, you know. Yeah, what like with the whole four hundred tribes being compressed yeah. into like, yeah, yeah. I know for a fact out in, in British Columbia, blood quantums are a huge thing in certain reservations. I met a girl in college that she left her reservation to go to school and her blood quantum was really low and they sent her a questionnaire in the mail and they said, okay, tick these boxes off and if you get enough points, you get to keep being native. And if you don't get enough points, cool. you don't get to be native ever again. And how Which, did <laughs> that go? Well, well, she basically gave them the middle finger and was like, you can't tell me if I'm native or not. And then they stripped her of her rights to to um, call herself an Indian under the Indian Act of Canada, which is a contentious issue in its own because some indigenous people don't believe in uh, calling themselves an Indian Act under the Indian Act of Canada, which I think is also fair. But that was the first time that I met somebody. You know, when you when you meet Native people, they always tell you where they're from. Always, always. You say, mm -hmm. my name's Morgan. I'm from Birch Island. Where are you from? You know, that's just how we introduce ourselves. And that was the first time that I met a Native person. And I was like, where are you from? And she's like, nowhere. I'm not from anywhere anymore because the government of Canada gave me a sheet of paper and told me that I failed the test. <laughs> that's crazy yeah i've never been handed a the the closest i've ever come to being um to being handed a white boy test uh i think was uh was when i did my geography tests on stream and didn't know where anything anywhere was that maybe that's more of an american <laughs> test and there weren't really any consequences that's an american test. yeah there weren't any consequences to me failing either so yeah it's but that just goes to show that you know the way the relationship between our race as a people 
to our government as an institution is wildly different from any other um, class of race that is in North America right now. And so if you're going to come on to a show with a large audience and start using Indigenous talking points, there are some things you got to be aware of that. You know, we don't have the privilege that... Um, that, for instance, black communities do in calling ourselves or assigning ourselves to um, to a group of people without interference from the government. And that plays into how we think about the land back movement, you know, that mm -hmm. we share a relationship with the government that other people do not. So to come out here and be like, yeah, it's OK if they want to genocide. It's first of all, it's a little insulting because our relationship with our government is a lot more nuanced than that, you know? Do you... Hmm. Well, I'm sure historically you would agree it was a genocide at the very least. Maybe... maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay, Absolutely. okay, yeah. Just Because I know some Absolutely. people are going to hear that differently. Um, I, I understand that. I think... Okay, we've been talking for a while, um, which has been great because it's been a great conversation. And I, I guess if I were to ask anything that I would want to leave it on... Uh, mm. speaking to my audience, which is mostly but not entirely American and mostly but not entirely white, what would, how would you say, what affect should we adopt while advocating for these issues? How should we be putting ourselves forward here? You know, um, what I think maybe the way I might do it is just look on a map and try to find the reservation that is closest to you. And there is somebody there that you can talk to or that you can, you know, ask for an interview or, or ask to opine on something. Or you can go to um, a lot of the time they have guest le lectures and guest speakers and things like that, that, you know, people from the community that you can meet who can really articulate these concepts for you. Because treaty law is one of the foundations of North American law. It is the first series of laws that was drafted um, in North America. And I really think that it is your responsibility as people who are living on Indigenous land to know what those treaties are, or at least understand the gist of what those treaties are, and to listen to what Indigenous people are saying about how those treaties work and about how they should look, you know, uh, just, I don't know, listen, <laughs> just listen. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I yeah. think that's, I think that's pretty damn agreeable. Um, yeah. I, uh, this has been a phenomenal conversation, you know, I really do appreciate you coming on here. I'm glad. Anytime, just give me a call. I'll be more than happy to talk out of my butt about native stuff for as long as I can. All it's right. probably my favorite thing to do as a half white person get to do that virtual signaling myself and not face any of the repercussions for it hey well uh you know there might be some if anyone in the future calls you a race trader or a sellout <laughs> or a pick me for having a pleasant conversation with me i'd like to apologize preemptively for that i feel like it's decent likelihood of that happening you don't deserve I'm, it i'm but positive i'm positive it's gonna happen yeah yeah that's okay i'll survive there's a big R word that native people use to describe themselves. It's called resilient. So I'll still be here. Yeah, more so than uh, a, a quite a bit, quite a bit more so than any group I'm associated with. I'll say that much, <laughs> except for, of course, gamers who you never mess yeah, with. Yeah, well, yeah, but are gamers really a, a people or are they a bunch of degens? Who's to say? I don't know. We uh, we agreed <laughs> we agreed that uh, they're capable of experiencing cultural genocide with the deletion of Minecraft worlds. So if you <laughs> if you can lay true. that out, then maybe yeah, I don't know. Um, that is true. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. I really really appreciate it. By the way, thank you for coming on. It was an absolute delight. You take care. Okay. You too. See you later. See you later. Bye. All right, that's two days in a row. We had two good conversations in a row. I don't know why chat is freaking out when I switch over to this mode, but it's very ugly looking. Uh, and I don't like it. Um, if I just fiddle with settings for a bit. Okay. There. Okay. Hopefully that. Okay. Nice. All right. 
Oh, that was a really good conversation. Do you guys feel satisfied by that one? I think um, I think that's probably the... I, I, I feel like that was the best conversation we've had thus far on indigenous issues, but I'm biased, of course, because we ended up getting along. So, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't have said that if she had come on here and disagreed with everything I had to say, but, you know. Um, I want to hear her talk to Professor Flowers. Professor Flowers would never, ever agree to have a conversation with her. Zero percent chance of that ever, ever happening. Okay. That would be a bad, bad move. All right. Um, but honestly, dude, she was firing shots. The, the guest, I mean, I, th I think she could, she could tear it down. Do you think PF would advocate for her being forced to leave because she's half white? Oh, shit. Do you think Professor Flowers would do the blood quantum thing? Do you think do you think Professor Flower would be like, well, of course you're white blood. We, I I don't know, man. I, all right, that's what I call a spicy spicy meme. You did such a great job. Well, I just I just I just talked. I mean, it's not. Um, but no, I I really enjoyed that conversation. I think I've actually been moved over a little bit, you know, on two main things. I think one of them is that I need to stop thinking of native spiritual ties to the land through a spiritual lens, which I will dismiss, always, and rather through a lens of cultural import, which we can apply in a secular sense, uh, and, and we have a, a much more like broad respect for. And also, the fact that even if I'm not Christian, I'm culturally Christian, which means that there are going to be elements of spirituality from native people that I might think is more like weird, or I might have less like immediate respect for than other religious groups that I'm more um that I'm more like familiar with or attached to so even if I believe in Christianity as little as I believe in native stuff which is true I would still like like she was right if somebody said like amen before eating around me like I wouldn't think about it but if somebody did like a little native chant then I probably would feel weird about it Obviously, part of that is just familiarity, but that familiarity, if absent, can breed a kind of political disaffiliation that leads to systemic oppression. So it's something you at least have to be familiar with, you know, or you should be aware of your unfamiliarity and not ascribe the feelings of unfamiliarity to some innate difference. So I'm really glad we got to think about that. I wish you asked her about the Sokotoa teacher clip. Fuck! I can't believe I forgot! Fuck! I can't believe I forgot! Why wouldn't you say that when we were talking? We were talking for an hour and a half! Why would you only say that now? Fuck! Bring her back. Call, like, call, call, call. Yeah. <laughs> Get her back in here. Um, ho I'm, hold on. Quick chat wants to know how did you feel about that white teacher doing the Soka Toa dance thing. There we go. Of course, she could also be gone, so we might not we might not be a response, but yeah. Anyway, um, you cringe ass mofo. No, it's okay. I typed it in all caps. Um, okay, wait, hold on. She says I felt real bad, like real bad. I mostly feel sorry for her, and I will continue to update you with what she says as she types it because typing is slower. I checked out her art station. She's a really good artist. Wait, wait, show me her shit. Wait, I forgot to ask if she wanted to plug anything. God damn it, I'll plug her. Hold on. This is her art station? I guess there are only so many people with this name, right? Oh, this is super cute. Oh my God, it's like Studio Ghibli tier like positivity. Can I show this? I'm allowed to show this, right? I think it's super cute. Typical small brain moment. Yeah, sorry, I don't have the... I don't have the best memory. I love the crow. A raven, sorry. Oh, she says, it's hard in this day and age to be so misunderstanding of the people whose lives pave the way for their success. All right, there we go. Nice, okay. The editors will, uh, the editors will link all relevant socials in the, uh, in the, in the thing.